If you have your Bibles with me, please open in Romans 4. We're going to steep a little bit into Romans today and to Paul's thoughts. And I entitled the message really with the first verse that we read there. And it's called, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Now, this doesn't sound like a whole lot. But really, when you think about it, some more and more truth comes out of that. When I saw this verse for the first time, or when I read it again, and it was like, Whoa, there's truth to it. And the more you think about it, the more it comes out. And Paul really tries to apply it to our life too because later on he says these, these words were not only written for Abraham but for us also. So really I want you to do the following. I want you to insert your name into the whole thing. And maybe you can do a whole much with, uh, according to the flesh, but just think about it. The term flesh, katazaka here, it actually really means that by means of our own resources and by our natural abilities. So really the verse actually reads here, just think of it, what then shall we say was gained by you and me, by Arnold Ellison, according to our natural abilities, according to our own resources. And Paul is really asking here a rhetorical question. Right? And the answer is only implied, but you can guess what the answer is. What is the answer? It's nothing. What was gained, but what do we gain according to our own natural resources, to our natural abilities? And Paul says it's nothing. Now, Paul is talking in this whole letter about grace, and we're getting there. And this really brings us down to the basics again. And on these basics, I want to dwell this morning a little bit. The first one that I would like to point out, I, I call obey it clear. What then shall we say was gained by us according to our own resources, according to our own natural abilities? This concept of work and faith is a very old one. And that has always, since the beginning it came up, there was always a tension. And all through the Bible to the very beginning, you always have this natural tension between faith and works. And we really live in a modern society where those two concepts get really entwined and, and you, you, there's really a fine line and you just never know where it mingles into the other one. And we are living in a culture in Europe is really not much different from, from the States here. We're, we'll have the same Western culture. Very often, we just derive our identity from the works that we're doing, right? When we introduce ourselves to someone, very often the things that we introduce ourselves with is, I'm a plumber. I, am, I work this job. And that's really the way that we also remember other people is, oh, this is Mr. So-and-so, he works this. And so our identity very often goes along with our work, our accomplishments, the job that we're having. And this is really also the problem why job, being jobless is actually so, such a heavy thing for us, right? I mean, in Austria, we have an unemployment service and it's, it's called AMS. And now we, we, we are a social country, right, in Austria. And the, they really cover you. So you literally get like for half a year, for a year, your last month's salary, exactly the same amount you get paid every single month, however long it takes. So you would actually think when people show up there at the unemployment service that they're happy. Because they get paid the same amount of money. It doesn't really matter if they go to work or not. They can sleep in every single morning. They can go fishing. They can go off, can do whatever they want. But it's not that way. Actually, when you go there and you see the faces, and I've been there a couple of times in transitional phases in my life, and when, when you see those faces, they, they feel so lost without a job. They feel like some of them have lost a, a sense of purpose in their life. And that's something really awkward. But we do derive our identity of who we are 
very often from what we do. And this is something that also transfers very often into the way that we think of us as Christians in the church. I've been to a couple of churches, and there's always, in church programs, there's always one crucial question, and that's how do you measure spiritual growth? And that's a really hard question, and I've been sitting in meetings where we have tried to come up with an answer, and I always tend to say, you can. You you just simply can. And the tendency is to 95% of those meetings is, you can tell by the works that the Christians are doing. So we do really have this in our minds that we, we derive our identity of who we are in Christ by how much we do for the Lord, how, how much we try to get done, how many meetings we attend, wh- whatever we do. So we, we have this in our heads that by what we do, it really shows who we are. But Paul reminds us here, that this is not the way when it comes to salvation, to our relationship with God, because what abilities and natural resources, what are out of our own human nature helped us that we got saved? It was the moment when we came to, on our knees, right? And we said, I have nothing. I have nothing to offer. And that was the moment. So Paul reminds us on this. I hope Lee doesn't crucify me later on because I'm preaching here that we don't have to work anymore, right? Because it's not that way, you know? It re- the, the work that we do has a part on the whole, it, the whole thing is actually a package deal, and I want to get there. And in James chapter 2, 17 to 18, we read, So also faith by itself, it does, if it does not have works, is dead. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. See that faith was active along with Abraham's works, and faith was completed by the works. Now, that's an interesting statement. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called friend of God. Faith was completed by his works. Our works really complete our faith. Now, this is something that we don't hear very often, but when you think of it, it it gives you a little bit different meaning of what we do every day. Now, some critical commentators, they, they made out here a little bit of a dispute between what Paul says in his letters that we are only saved by grace and by what James says that, you know, works have a part too. But really, there's not a conflict because what Paul says is really the beginning of our faith. Our salvation is right at the cross, right when we are at their knees. What James is highlighting here is the continuation of our faith and the maturing part of it and that works very well are, are included in that. And Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 3, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is in Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each each one's works will become manifest. So Paul also has this, if we build upon the work that Christ has done in us in the beginning, So there is a very strong sense that this is only the beginning and there's also continuation of it and that works really are part of it. Our identity is not derived from the works that we do. It doesn't really define us because we have that in Christ. He's our foundation and we build on that. But just like a fruit tree has a purpose in life, has a purpose in the course of his span, right? And it's to bear fruit. So also we have a purpose. And let me ask you this, how does a fruit tree bear fruit? Is it by squeezing really hard and then the fruit just pops up? We have a fruit tree out in our garden. We have an apple tree and they have beautiful red apples. They're so beautiful that one day a guy came knocking on our door and says, hello, oh, I don't know you. Well... (laughs) 
Okay, so you must be the new guy. See, your former owners, they always allowed us to pick up your apples that fell down to the ground. Like, okay, that's, that's something new. And what he does is he, pick, he collects them and he picks them and he brings them to the deers, he feeds them to the deers and he's try, just trying to make nice pictures. So I invite him, you know, come in, help yourself. We have a little bit of a wasp problem and they eat all the apples before he gets there, but you know... <laughs> But we have wonderful apples. And just think of it, how do the apples come about? The, the tree doesn't do anything, right? It's really the tree who is actually standing in this ground. He's rooted in the ground, and his roots go down deep to where his nourishment comes from. And I really don't really know the terminology here, but you know, when, when winter comes and all the sap goes down in the roots, and it just stays there, Right? right until spring when the roots are warming up again and the whole circulation starts all over again. And it's something that happens very, very natural. The tree doesn't have any accomplishment. It doesn't work for it. It doesn't squeeze hard or rub branches or anything. It just comes all by itself because it's in the nature of that tree. All it does, it's just staying rooted. And I really like our, our church symbol, taking roots, and bearing fruit. And this is, this is really what it is. It's a package deal, right? Now, Paul reminds us that in this part of bearing the fruit, we can add nothing. And that's, sometimes it's good to just hear that. That it really is the work of God. I mean, just this morning in the worship time, right? What did we accomplish that, that God's presence is here? Nothing. Just being open, just coming with an open heart, just opening up the door. And just, I think the key really is just to pay attention, just to lay aside whatever the concerns are in the day, whatever brings you here to the doors, whatever fears, anxieties, hopes, thoughts about the future, whatever it is, but just to drop it right at the foot of the cross. Yeah. And that's really the only work. And then everything starts all by itself. The circulation starts. And God just slowly starts to bear fruit. And it's fruit in places where we would have never thought fruit would ever come by. But it's just God working. Maybe you sit here this morning and you feel like nothing is really moving forward in your life. Maybe you feel like, you know, maybe you should be at a different place and, and as a mature Christian, everyone is talking about maturity and discipleship programs, and you wonder if you should sign up. You, you, you wonder if you have come to a point where it kind of stagnates in your life. The reason why we grow is very often not because we don't have faith, but it's because sometimes we don't follow up on this still small voice that sometimes come echoing in the back of our minds. And it's very often just until the moment until we do and we obey what this small voice says until things start moving forward again. And if you sit here and you're being reminded right now by the Holy Spirit on what he has been telling you over and over again, and it comes at certain moments more clear than in others, follow up on it. God wants to bear fruit. God wants to touch your work colleagues. God wants to be there and touch your neighbors when they're broken. When they have a family fight, God wants to touch them. When you're going to school, God wants to touch the, your colleagues, your schoolmates. God has a work and he wants the circulation to get going. He wants your roots to warm up again. He, he wants to do something through you. And it's really only by that that we ever feel like, yeah, God has a place in our life. Only if we get to this part of bearing fruit, we, we, we sense like God is arriving there where he, where he actually wants us to be. And this is really this, this feeling that we are complete in God. And our identity is this whole package deal, right? It is saved by faith, but also seeing how God bears forth fruit in our lives and how he touches other people's lives through us. 
And maybe if you find yourself in, in, in a haze, in a spiritual haze, and you just can't make much sense of it, you want to meet God, but, you know, there's just so much going on. You know what, I, Oswald, I really like Oswald Chambers. What he once said is, you cannot think a spiritual model clear. You have to obey it clear. I really like that. With, with intellectual matters, we can reason them out. We can make a pro and contra list and just go by it. And, you know, we can just figure it out. But when it comes to spirit things, there's just no way of figuring it out. We'll always get entangled until we end up in a knot. The only thing you can do is obey it clear to follow up on what this small voice is saying. So this is really my first point. Obey it clear. The second truth that I want to get out of this text, and I call it different just before coming up here, is let go of what is seen. In verse 23, we read onward, then, but the work, but the words, it was credited to him, was not written for his sake alone, but for us also. It will be credited to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now this it was credited to him as righteousness, and Paul says it will be credited to us as righteousness. We always hear this sentence about Abraham, but we forget that this counts for us too. It will be granted to us as righteousness. Now, what's this whole talk about righteousness? I mean, it sounds like a word that was relevant up until the Middle Ages with Shining knights in shining armors and on strong horses defending the weak and fighting for the good cause, right? But when you go out in the shopping mall today and you ask someone, what do you think righteousness really means? They probably come up with something like, well, I think it means we shouldn't steal or not kill anyone or when we go out hunting not to shoot anyone on purpose or so. <laughs> People don't really understand anymore what this word means, righteousness. But really what it means is a right standing with God. The state of being in a proper relationship with God and doing what is in alignment with his will for our lives. Paul gives us to understand that our right standing with God is not earned. It is not anything that we can achieve. It comes by free grace. And we only access this by faith just like a child. If you want to know what faith is, over there, lots of kids' room. Just look at them. Just look at them, you know? Helen, last night, she couldn't sleep. She came out again. It's like, I'm scared, scared. She just said scared. And Liam was still awake. So we went inside, and we prayed. And Liam helped praying. Dear Jesus, help Helen not to be scared, right? It was just simple like that. But man, faith is not more than that. Faith is just trusting God, that God is the one. It's not by our accomplishments. He's the one who does it. Can't add anything but coming. The only thing we do is coming and giving him room. Now Paul goes on and he says, this is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offsprings, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is our father of us all. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, Abraham believed against hope. Paul says, Abraham believed even, even though it made no sense at all. That, that's what he's saying. But it doesn't have to make sense, right? God calls to in, to, into existence the things that do not exist. I want you to think about this sentence for a moment, for your own life. 
What does that mean when you hear this this morning, that God can call into existence in your life the things that do not exist, and that he can give life to what you already thought was dead? You have written it off, you sign it off, and there's just nothing good will come from it. But God works different. Who was here on Friday night for this awesome movie? We watched. All, we had a really great movie night. There was like the, the life of, of 12 individuals that just followed up on the, on the message of the cross and were just deeply touched by Christ. And they, they didn't know how things will, will come about. But only because they did not know how, when, and where. They did not give up faith. And that's really the key. Only because we do not know how things will come about means nothing. God has a way of creating things out of nothing. He calls into existence the things that do not exist. And you, we never know from what venue God comes and all of a sudden things happen. Things show up. Things start to happen. We never know. All we have to do is stay close to God and just give him the room for it. And this is really what Abraham did too. I mean, Elijah, when he told his servant to go back and watch if there's rain coming because of three years of drought, you know, no rain. And the servant says, well, I just see a cloud. It's just as big as a fist, just, you know, just a cloud. Elijah goes to the king and says, rain's coming. If the disciples, when, when Jesus had them the people sit down and they tell the people, 5,000 people to sit down on behalf of five loaves and two fishes. Only because they can't see it, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. God has a way of doing things out of nothing. And he just comes up. All he needs is just these little steps. Just have them sit down. Don't run away and say, this is crazy, I can't handle it anymore. Just do it. Just do it and he will do the rest. Maybe that's what you have to hear for your colleagues too. Your colleagues are in this brain. You have no idea how you can ever help their family situation. How you can be of service. How God could work through you. And, and you're thinking ways up of maybe just, you know, helping them or just something. But, and it's good. Do that. But be open. God has a way of creating things out of nothing. And to call to life things that are dead. Give room to him and be there when it happens because God will bless it. And sometimes we just, get, just can't hang up with the things that we see. Okay, I'm a counseling pastor, so I, I, I can say that. I have to bring in something psychological here. <laughs> there is something that's called fixation, right? So when you fix your eyes on something, and you just can't let go of it. You fix your eyes on it, and you're, it's called attention focus, and you're, you have just such a tunnel vision that all you see is this thing, and you can't think of anything else, and it really becomes a hindering thing when the other life that surrounds you is hindered by that because you're just never really there. All you do is just have this tunnel vision, and you're fixated on one thing and nothing else can come and be part of your life. And this is the spiritual matter too because God wants us to not be fixated on something. God is there and God has a venue of, he has a way of doing things different. All that God wants is this room. So when you're here this morning and your attention was focused on something that you see or maybe something that you want to see done, take the courage and take your eyes off of that thing. And give God the room to do whatever he wants to do. Maybe it's a moment again where you just have to bring it all in you to the cross. And just, just give God the room for it. Letting go of the scene. And the third one, the third truth that we can really draw from this text is where we read, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And I really like the NIV translation because it says credited. The other translations, they say counted. But I like credit because Jana just had to explain to me the difference between a debit card and a credit card here. <laughs> and it just reminds me of it, right? Credited. 
And that's really what it is. God did not give Abraham a debit card. And on that debit card is whatever he has earned in his trust relationship with God. And whatever he draws from it is only down to zero and then it's gone. God really gave Abraham a credit card where he can go even below his trust level in God. I guess that's called doubt. God has room for doubt. God can handle it. I mean, here is Abraham, and we call him the, the father of our faith. And he is Mr. Righteousness in person, right? He was credited the righteousness. He's the father of our faith, and still there was room for doubt. And it was okay with God that Abraham could doubt. In Romans 9, we read 7 to 8, And not all the children of God... Not all are children of God because of their offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are counted offsprings. Paul is talking here about the two sons that Abraham had. And for thousands of years down in history, it shows that Abraham was known to have had two sons, one according to his flesh because he doubted, and one son of the promise and just think of how it came i mean god gave abraham a promise in an age that's just absolutely ridiculous right abraham said yeah you know and even after he had that promise year after year after year passed by and nothing happened in this movie that we watched on friday evening things happened really fast I mean, you know, we can sit here for a couple of years and just watch the same movie. So things had to move fast. But just add to whatever happens just a couple of years and hanging in there and just waiting for change, waiting for God to step in and transform a situation. Year after year after year after year and decade after decade. And this is really what, what happened to Abraham. And Abraham, after so many years of not seeing anything of the fulfillment of the promise, you know, Sarah and, 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 and Abraham, they just talked and said, maybe, maybe God's promise just comes by a different venue. I mean, we don't know. So they said, you know, Abraham's just going to lay with, this, with their slave girl and Hagar and Ishmael was born then. For us, it's an unthinkable thing, but really back then in the ancient Mesopotamian culture in the ancient Near East, that was a common thing. And it was actually not considered a sin at all. It was just not what Abraham and Sarah expected. They had an expectation that God would step in and do something in a normal, regular way. But after year, after year, after year, nothing happened. They thought, well, maybe just you know, maybe it's our fault. Maybe we should have moved a couple of years ago. Maybe we should have done something. So they just step up and say, you know, we just go the other way. And we, we just take that. And for thousands of years later on, Abraham is known, Mr. Righteousness, the father of our faith, is called that he had two sons, one of the doubt, one according to his flesh, and one son of the promise. It's not very flattering, really. But all it shows is that God has room for doubt. And even though Abraham was called the friend of God. God has still room for doubt. God can handle it. Maybe you're here this morning and you're doubting about situations or something. God has room for doubts. I mean, let's not forget, God gave Abraham a promise, but not a roadmap, right? Has God given you ever a promise? Any promise, just something. Now, has he given you a roadmap? Good, I'm not the only one. I will feel bad about that. God, God tends to do that. A preacher once said in, in Europe, God tends to show us how and sometimes even when, but rarely by what it comes by or through what venues and channels it comes in. The Bible always tells us how, but often not no, and why, but not where and when. It's, 
just a couple of things that we don't know. God gives us promises. God tells us things. He, he teaches us. He speaks to us with his small voice, right? But there's no roadmap to it. So we, and we have to live every single day and make decisions every single day. And our life as Christians is really a life in this tension between the promise and making everyday decisions on a daily basis. But just be encouraged, God can handle failures. God can handle doubts. And he has no problem if you ever go below that trust level and if you start doubting. God is there, and whatever comes, he, he will lead it. And the key here really is what, what Paul then writes later on in Galatians 4.29. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Sounds harsh, but what's Paul saying? Paul is saying, don't settle for less. Don't settle for anything else than God's promise. God has given all of us promises, and God tells us in life, how he wants us to be. God wants to lead us forward. He wants to mature us. He wants to do things in our life, and he wants to be active. He wants to bear fruit through our life. Now, we have no idea how this should come about, but the key really is not to settle down for anything less that's his perf than his perfect plan for our lives. I really like Celebrate Recovery. We just started, and I'm sitting in there too, and you know what? I don't know what you think of, of these people, but when, when I hear stories in Celebrate Recovery, I hear stories of Abraham, of Moses, of Isaac, of David, of Elijah. People with doubts. People that sometimes get stuck in life because of life situations. Things happen in life. We can't always direct every circumstance of our life, but God has a way of turning things in, into the positive. He calls into existence things that do not exist, and he calls to life things that are dead. Just take this thought with you in this week, just wherever it is that you think nothing good can happen out of that. All the big heroes of the faith in the Bible went through the same thing, and those are the greatest stories. Because God does things out of nothing. That's the way he created the world, right? He has his way. I really just want to close here in prayer. I ask you to stand up. If you feel like that, that God is speaking to you this morning and there are some things that you feel like you should obey clear. Or if your eyes are on something that you want to see done, or just you can't let go of the things that you see because it's just hard to look away. Or if you maybe sense that you have settled down for something else than the perfect thing that God has for you, then I want to encourage you this morning to just open yourself up to God again. All that Abraham did was no work it was just giving God room to work, and God did. And God let stuff happen in his life. Holy Father, I thank you for each one who is here this morning, Father, and that you have brought them here, that you have a story which, with each single person there that only, that only you know so well. Father, sometimes we just get hang up in life. We have to take decisions every single day and we move forward and just sometimes we fail, sometimes we fall. We stagnate. I just ask you this morning, Father, that you will help us to obey it clear. Speak up with your small voice again that we can sense it again where you put your finger in our life, if there's anything that holds us back from giving you the room in our life. 
Help us to obey it clear. Point out the things again. Help us to take our eyes off of the things that we just fixated on. Help us, Father. We know that you want to work all around us, that you want to move our hearts in directions that we would have never thought you would. Help us to get our eyes and our hearts set off of the things and just bring it again to the cross, to lay them down at the cross and ask you to fill all in all. Help us, Father, not to settle for anything less than what your plan is for our life. If we get stuck every once in a while, Father, guide us out of it. Guide us out of it and lead us to the next mountain experiences again, to meet you again face to face. Help us through those valley times, Father. Give us your anointing and the presence of your Holy Spirit in our every single day, small working, small works life. Help us in the little bits and pieces that we have to face every day. You're right there. The decisions we have to take are not anything bigger than that, but help us to stay faithful to those little matters so that you have the room, the maximum room in our life to bring forth the fruit that you want us to bear so that we can feel whole in you again. We thank you, Father, for this. And we commit ourselves into your hand. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.